All right, guys. Thank you again for tuning in to everything going on over the course of the Sacramento Horror Film Festival. We got another cool guest interview for you right now. This guy is the director of the Subspecies franchise. He also, you know, did Dungeon Master. He's done all kinds of different work in film. He also, uh, we may get into some not so much horror stuff that Ted has done, but let me bring him in. Mr. Ted Nicolau is here with us. How you doing, sir? I'm good. How about you? Good, man. Good. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um. So. First and foremost, I mean, the subspecies saga, uh, you know, you put your, definitely put like your own spin on that franchise. And I've heard, I've heard in interviews uh, that you've done before that, the, you know, the pipe dream or the dream, the ambition is to return to it someday. But when you were coming up with those characters in that style, what, where did it come from? Where did you get draw your inspiration from? Uh, the very first subspecies was actually written by a writer named David Pabian, I believe. And uh, uh, so the character of Radu, the character of Stefan, the three students that were coming to Romania was did not originate with me. What uh, originated with me from the first film was I brought in a, a writer friend of mine named Jack Canson, um, who uh, did a rewrite on the script and added the bloodstone and, you know, kind of set in motion a lot of the, the mythology that we played with in the film. Uh, I think where, where my major contribution came was uh, when Charlie Band proposed that we could shoot the film in Romania. And this was like six months after the revolution that toppled Ceausescu. Um, and I went over to Romania and, just met the people that I'd be working with and traveled around the country and saw the locations that we could access. And for me as a filmmaker, you know, when you see locations like that and realize, you know, the, the there was, it was wide open. The country was wide open for filming. And even though I knew that the film was going to be limited in resources and the equipment that they had was very old, um, the the sense of artistry in the Romanian soul and the the incredible actors and the theatrical tradition that went on there all kind of contributed that and the the absolutely kind of sinister atmosphere of of Bucharest in those days uh, yeah. contributed to the to the movie itself and and basically for me it was just a matter of could we finish filming before everybody went crazy and the actors exploded, you know? <laughs> <laughs> was that, you know, going out there, that opportunity to film a monster movie in a country like Romania, like that, you know, when you look up subspecies, that's one of the first things that makes that, that franchise so unique is the fact that you did go out there. You know, it's not a, uh, a Dracula movie in a sound stage in Los Angeles, so to speak. Like yeah. you, guys are, you guys are actually out there in it. Um, what is that like compared to doing something more, I guess, American made, like the creepiness factor definitely from a viewing standpoint is uh, substantially higher because yeah. you, you can tell it's not sets like you're filming actual, you know, uh, landscapes and stuff. But what was that like being behind the camera and you're you're making a monster movie where everybody thinks that they actually come from? <laughs> uh, you know, the the being there uh, it was such an eerie experience. The first few weeks I was there by myself with a Romanian producer and they put me up in Ceausescu's summer palace, which is on Lake Snagoff. And across the lake is apparently the place where Vlad Dracul was, uh, was buried. Mm -hmm. And I, and I started feeling like Charlie band had sold me to a bunch of vampires and out of the forest, cause we were in the middle of this forest and, and there was nothing to do, no food to eat, no restaurants to go to nothing, but just to sit there and, stew in the horror of it all 
Um, so for a while, I really did start fantasizing that I was going to be eaten by vampires. Uh, and one night there was this loud banging on the door of the hotel and it was just me and a couple of soldiers. And, and I, <laughs> I am so ashamed and I was terrified, terrified to be there. And, uh, it turned out there was a car wreck up the road in the forest. Uh, but scared the hell out of me. But in, in a way, it also the the ability to shoot in Romania kind of spoiled me for the rest of my movie making because the now I sort of expect the landscapes and the architecture to contribute mightily to the movie like like they did in subspecies. And the the feeling that we could go to folklorists and dance professors and kind of learn about the, the actual rituals against the undead. They didn't really believe in vampires. Uh, they were more like werewolf believers, but, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, the, the sense that they're, they're the undead malign influence of the undead was there in the villages. So, so all around us was really a sense of that history and everywhere you would poke your head, you know, into a dark, corner of a castle or a tunnel uh, just was mysterious and a little bit terrifying. What was it that you wanted to do with your vampires that, where you came up with your design for them? Because they are like your, you know, everybody likes to put a spin on, you know, Frankenstein or whatever the monster may be. And you're, you're, vamps are unique in their own right too what where did you kind of say in the in the pre-production process like this is what i'm kind of going for you know the uh for me uh growing up i was like a frankenstein fan and uh Dr dracula movies never really kind of did it for me it didn't terrify me very much um but when i had the opportunity to make the film um I kind of went back to Nosferatu for inspiration because I I feel like if you're going to be a vampire, you're going to be a like a creature and a, a rabid sort of creature, not like this elegant uh, vampire. So so I kind of used Nosferatu as the inspiration uh, when Anas Hove, who plays Radu, kind of came out to Bucharest, and I and he and I started talking. Uh, Basically, the the makeup it was already in motion with Greg Canham's uh, effects company. Um, but when they put the makeup on Radu for the first time, and he and I just kind of went up to that uh, castle on the hill that you see in the film and just kind of wandered around together for a little while, trying to figure out how does he walk? How does he talk? And uh, I wanted that that vocal quality that was like his lungs were dried out and uh and honest you know he's a serious actor and he uh really tried to get his head around what it was that i wanted for that character and then he took it 10 times farther you know he's so fantastic in that role charlie in the chat is asking when did you realize that he was going to you know he's creating an iconic character was it like the first time you saw him <laughs> he got up like first day on on set for, for filming or was it a little bit before? Uh, you know what? <clears throat> the making of that movie was so uh, trying and challenging because uh, wine was incredibly cheap in, in Romania at the time. Uh, Honest was a big drinker. Uh, Michael Watson was a big drinker. And uh, there was always tension between uh, the actors and the production and the, the crew was always up at arms because the money was always late in arriving. We were, there was never enough film to shoot for a few days at a time. So every day we had to economize on the film. So for me, I was just trying to figure out how to get through the movie. And even the guy who was doing the makeup uh, on Honest you know, just kind of laughed and said, this is going to be high camp, this movie. So I was working against the, the, the flood of kind of people's like negative energy that was on the set. And, yeah. and so I did not realize, I knew that Honest was incredible in the role. And I knew that 
when I would see him like in the corridors of the of Prejmer Fortress or, or any of those sequences, I knew that that the images were powerful. But it wasn't until we came back to the States and edited the film, screened it for Paramount that I realized that, oh my God, this character could go on for movie after movie. And um, then when we when I got to write Subspecies 2 and 3 and kind of made a deal with Honest, you know, let's make this deal between us. Uh, no drinking on the set. And uh, when it comes time to take off your makeup at night for the hour that it takes them to remove the makeup, I'll come with you to the room and we'll drink a bottle of wine together. And uh, that that agreement worked out really well. And uh, <laughs> uh, so like the, it kept yeah. him subdued at least. Yeah, he he was. It kept him focused. Let's say, and and by that time he he was in love with the character too. And and I think in subspecies two and three he becomes a deeper and more complex kind of uh, character, which appealed to him. Yeah, it's one thing. All the filmmakers that I've had the pleasure of interviewing that have had a franchise, and it's another thing in film school that they always teach you is. If you get one, you get the opportunity to make one. Never count on making another one. Like, <laughs> you, you've gotten your one. So the fact, so you just, you know, the reason why I'm I'm saying that is because when you said you brought it back and you're screening it to Paramount and you're like, man, like he's a character that can continue, continue. You know, the reception to the film obviously contributes to the fact that there's more like that had to be a rad feeling that this thing was so well received yeah. that you were going to get to make it. Yeah, it, it truly was. And, and, you know, Paramount liked it enough that they requested the sequel. Charlie in, in his way, you know, went, well, let's not just make one sequel. Let's shoot two sequels back to back. And um, for me, uh, after coming home from Bucharest that first time, the, the experience was so kind of traumatizing and yet beautiful at the same time. And the friendships that, that I made with the Romanian crew and some of the Romanian actors uh, were so uh, so magnetic to me that the idea that I could come back again, once you come home and you, and, and you just forget all of, the, all of the horrors of making the movie, uh, what's left are the beautiful memories of drinking wine with friends at night and talking and laughing and in the midst of, you know, this, you know, the brutally cold winter and all of that. So, so yeah, getting to come back and do two and three was like a gift, you know? Yeah. What was it? What, what was it like working with Charlie band as your producer? Is he, was he, you know, hands off or was he like very much hands on? Charlie is a unique sort of a producer. And I, I know him uh, well because I was, I edited a lot of his films before I started directing. And um, so he, he trusted my, you know, what I would bring to the, to the movie. And he is a, he's kind of uh, involved with the script a little bit. I mean, the, the scripts uh, of those days of full moon and empire, both you would write them fast and maybe you'd do a second draft and then you'd be, off in pre-production and before you know it, you finish shooting it. Um, it. But Charlie loves movies. And so the, you know, as long as it's looking pretty good and the cinematographer is good, um, he's happy. The only kind of road bump that we hit on the very first subspecies was uh, after the first week of shooting, um, he saw the dailies. He was in Italy, saw the dailies and, uh, Vlad Paunescu, who was the Romanian director of photography, really talented, but had a style of shooting that was Romanian um, and and a style of lighting that was Romanian. And and we were shooting on a on Orvo film stock, this kind of Russian film stock. Um, and Charlie hated the look of the film. So so he called me and said, we got to fire Vlad. And. Uh, we'll send Adolfo Bartoli, who was his kind of favored Italian cinematographer at the time. And by that time, I knew that Vlad, Vlad and I were close by that time because he, he and his uh, girlfriend, now wife, uh, Juana, 
who was a costume designer, brilliant costume designer of the films, um, had sort of helped me get through the first weeks of pre-production and showed me around Bucharest and took me to theater and took me to the to the bars where the actors went after the shows and and introduced me to a an incredible lifestyle there, even though it was poor and desperate and there was nothing to buy. Uh, and I knew that Vlad controlled the crew and the thought that he that Charlie would bring in Adolfo and and change everything. Uh, I said, no, that can't happen. You know, so I had to go drive down to Bucharest to the to the Bufta film studios and meet with all the muckety mucks of the Romanian side of the production because it was a co-production where the Romanians were paying for the the Romanian side of it. So uh, I had to defend Vlad to them and then to Charlie. And luckily I won that argument and Charlie sent Adolfo to Bucharest and Adolfo came and sat with us on the set and kind of told Vlad a few tricks about backlight and, and uh, how to light the film. And Vlad learned very quickly and Adolfo came, took me aside and said, please, Ted, I don't want to, I do not want to come to Bucharest. So uh, work it out. So, so uh, we did. And Vlad shot number one. He ended up owning the studio that Charlie kind of set up when we went back to do numbers two and three. And he shot two and three. And Adolfo ended up living in Bucharest for a number of years, like teaching the crews there how to work in a Western style. Uh, did that answer your question? I, I don't know, but <laughs> it was something. <laughs> no, I I would say so. Yeah, the uh, okay. the um... oh Charlie Band, that was it. That was the only time Charlie really interfered. And Charlie's father, Albert Band, was mm -hmm. like his uh, counselor uh, in everything creative. And Albert uh, would come into the cutting room and and you know have people rearrange scenes or. Ed, uh, take out scenes. And uh, because I had been an editor and had worked with both of them before, I kind of knew their style and knew and learned a lot, learned a lot from Albert. So uh, because I did not fight with Albert, I just kind of worked with him. You know, I, I got, I, I was very lucky that I had a pretty easy run of things and Charlie was always uh, supportive. I mean, as long as you can make it for no money and, and shoot it in a ridiculous the quick uh, schedule, uh, Charlie was pleased. And it looked like a movie when it was over with, you know. Yeah, another good question coming in. That was going to be my next question, too, is being a, a child of the 80s, one of the films when you're old enough to uh, <laughs> sneak in and watch a, a horror movie. By the by, the laugh, maybe you know which one I, I'm, I'm about to talk about. Uh Texas Chainsaw Massacre. You, yeah. You worked on the sound department under Toby Hooper. Yeah. That film, man, and one of the most iconic parts was in your department, in the sound department of that film. With no, uh, you know, with no sound that is associated with that movie. I don't know if it's as scary as it is, but what, what, was it like working on that film and then, you know, working under, under Hooper? That film uh, was a total trial by fire for those of us who were uh, at University of Texas Film School. And basically we were still film students and we were kind of smart Alex and thought we knew everything like film students can do. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, Toby was a little bit older than us, a little bit more stoned than we were. And uh, basically every day he and Kim Henkel would kind of just sit and think for a couple of hours about what we were going to shoot that day. And we were like film students who, who, you know, you're supposed to be prepared. You're supposed to start shooting immediately. Don't waste any time. Uh, so we didn't really understand what how great the film was going to turn out at the time. You know, we knew that it was terrifying and some of the tableaus that were set up in front of the camera were like, you know, incredibly powerful. And um, Daniel Pearl did a great job as a director of photography on that film, but it wasn't until it was edited and it was in the cutting room for like a year uh, getting kind of honed down. It wasn't until we saw the film that we realized what a, 
what an amazing job Toby had done. That film, you know, one of the things that is so iconic on top of this, the sound is the fact that when you're out there on the ranch with the family, you feel like you're getting dirty. Like, yeah, yeah. Is that, you know, I got to imagine it's a, a test to the fact that it's shot on film and it's shot in that environment. But were you guys, when you were out there, do you know if they were doing anything on top of it other than just adjusting the camera? Were they like blowing the you know the dust up or what they were doing? No, that was a brutally hot Texas summer uh, and uh, 16 millimeter film. Uh, and basically we were out at this farmhouse and just burning up every day. And that is the, the sweat and the grit of Texas dust blowing in your face, you know, man, that is a, uh, you know, a film that uh, I think leaves a lasting impact. Was there a, a, a certain mix that you did in the sound department for it? That was kind of your fave as you were, as you were coming up with stuff. You know, my, my contribution was basically as the location sound recordist. So oh. my challenge was to, capture all the dialogue with my boom man or to, to lavalier people like when they're in the car. Uh, I'm most proud that I don't think any lines had to be ADR. Yeah. So it's all live sound. Um, and then we spent a day or two like recording uh, watermelons getting cracked open and, and chicken bones and celery and stuff like that, that were, that could be used in post-production. And then I think uh, Toby got really lucky when he came out uh, to Los Angeles to mix the film. And I believe he sort of had access to the Exorcist's uh, sound effects library, too. Oh, wow. So so I think it it enhanced what was already there. But but I was not involved with the with the post. Well, the the boom operation and the, the thing I will tell you as a film student, man, that is a testament to you because I hate <laughs> to do audio mixes and all that uh, stuff. That's one of the worst feelings is when you have a full day of shooting and for whatever reason, the the dialogue isn't syncing up with the lips, man. Yeah, well, that's that. The syncing is one thing, but, the, but if it, you can't hear it, I mean, it's almost like I think a movie with bad sound looks crappier than a movie with a bad image, you know? Uh, yeah. And so sound is really important and and to coordinate between the sound recordist and the boom operator who's actually, you know, muscling the, the microphone in the air and trying to pan it around and capture everybody takes a lot of uh, skill. You know? And one thing that you had a hand in that I can remember in my early teen years when this film came out, HBO did like an inside look or first look at the haunting from the, from the, oh, like, uh -huh. from the late nineties. And I know you've, you've done a ton of like documentary work as well. And that's kind of like what that, that was, was like the inside look is showing like how we're going to scare the hell out of you. Yeah. Yeah. That did was fun. You, that, uh, Getting to do the behind the scenes, was that a uh, kind of like a thing? Have you always liked doing like the documentary type stuff? Did you? No, actually, uh, you know, my kind of the, the in the 90s, I spent most of the 90s like out of the country two or three months out of every year. And about 2000, uh, Charlie's company kind of like uh, collapsed again. And I was like left with not much to do. And uh, I had a friend named Barbara Tonys and uh, her husband, Gary Allen, owned a company that was that did marketing and uh, for Disney. And uh, I kind of reinvented myself for a few years there and learned from her kind of how to do documentaries. And they gave me a lot of opportunities. And because I was a director, I sort of brought something to their company that they didn't have before. Um, and so that the haunting was one of the first pieces that I got to do for them. And we shot those kind of uh, recreations of the ghost stories. Mm -hmm. Before 
we get to the not so scary stuff, there's one film that is to say that it's cult classic, I would say is the understatement of the century because there is uh you know, there's no monster like the monster from terror vision. Yeah. That's and true. there's no, there's no, uh, cast we actually at sinister creature con we got to talk with uh garrett graham a few years ago oh man and uh he was just as hilarious in person as he is in the film but that movie man everything from the swingers jokes <laughs> to the fact that they're you know they're they're got this giant monster that he's almost like just a big ugly pet dog in some <laughs> retrospects like uh -huh. but what what was that like man like doing putting that together and then uh, behind the scenes just with that cast i gotta imagine was a blast that movie to me was like such an opportunity uh finally after editing a million movies for charlie i got the opportunity to do terror vision and uh when he showed me basically back in those days he would have posters made and uh that would be the first step in the development process. And he showed me this poster monster coming out of a TV set. And I said, Oh, I'll do that. I'd like to do that movie. Uh, can I make it a comedy? And he wasn't known for comedies at the time, but to his credit, he said, yeah, okay, why not? So I wrote the script and I tried to put into it everything that I had been reading about, uh, uh, about survivalism and, and swingers in Los Angeles and rock and roll. And I, uh, in, in those days we would go to club lingerie on Friday and Saturday nights in, uh, Hollywood. And I'd see Mary Warnoff and, uh, the Fibonacci's the band that plays the, uh, that wrote the opening uh, song for television. So kind of the, the world I was living in kind of fed that movie quite a bit. And, uh, John Beekler, who whose uh, shop created the monster, when I, when it was time to do the monster, I we got into a lot of arguments about the creature because I wanted him to be asymmetrical and stupid looking and lovable looking and have crazy appendages, and it was unlike anything that Beekler had ever done. But to his credit, he like uh, he took on the challenge, and his sculptors were incredible, and. Uh, they made this thing. It was so fucking unbelievably hard to move around between Los Angeles and Italy and, and incredibly hard to slather down with, with, uh, you know, methylcellulose. Yeah. Every time they just left a trail of, of lubricant everywhere you went. Um, so, and, uh, kind of the, when I got to Italy and saw the sets, basically I had had uh, Giovanni Natalucci, the, the Italian uh, production designer, come to Los Angeles. And we went through a lot of books of, of houses, locations in the Valley and talked about swinging and talked about, uh, you know, all the stuff. And he went back to Italy and designed this set. And uh, when I walked on the set for the first time and saw the erotic art on the walls and the conversation pit in the living room and the, the pleasure palace in the, the gigantic jacuzzi, it was like, holy shit, this is going to make this movie <laughs> beyond what I even imagined. Uh, and then uh, add on top of that casting Garrett Graham, which was like the most lucky thing that, that we could have done. And Mary Warnoff, who I wanted to play, I wanted her to play the Elvira like character, uh, Medusa. Mm -hmm. um, and she came in to audition for that. And, and she said, you know, m most people would, hire me for that part. But you know, the part that I'd really like to play is the mother. And when Mary Warnoff says that to you, you just go, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. And Mary is incredible because she is like the least motherly person that you could ever meet, you know, but uh, she brought something to that movie. That's just incredible. And then Diane Franklin and uh, you know, Chad Allen, it just went on and on and on. The the combination of that cast shooting in Italy, we had a hotel that was about 20 minutes from the old Dino De Laurentiis studios, which is where we were shooting on the beach in a little town called Tor Vionica and a patio overlooking the ocean. And every night was just like, you know, mad wine drinking dinner parties until 
you know, well after midnight. So that I, I thought, oh, wow, this is what the rest of my life is going to be like. Little did I know that a few years later, I'd be freezing my ass off in Romania. <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, the monster, did you get to, uh, you said the appendages on him, like where, where did you draw from with how you, you told him you wanted him sculpted? Cause he's got appendages coming out of him that make, zero sense yeah. other, than the fact that he is, other than the fact that he's from another world and he came out of the family's tv so there is no rule as to what he should look like but i'm curious did you just kind of say the craziest shit that we could come up with let's do it or what did you try to draw upon for him i think i drew upon little bits and pieces of creatures that i liked i mean the the overall kind of big booger turd kind of body shape uh yeah. Just kind of came about somehow through his sculptors. I definitely wanted a pincer uh, and definitely wanted a, a tentacle with a little eyeball on it and one big eye and one little eye. It was really like uh, between my just kind of talking about what it, what it should be and then his artists and sculptors kind of drawing designs and you know yeah this looks good let's let's do go in this direction and uh and john finally just kind of giving in because he was also directing uh uh troll at the time so his his brain was in on his own own movie so a lot of his own character his own artists kind of took over and helped create that monster and then took like five people to operate him you know yeah, that I mean, he's he's takes up seventy percent of every shot that he's in. So I gotta <laughs> imagine that the the puppeteering of that thing. I mean, we're nowadays the bonus features on something like you know Star Wars or or anything like that. They talk about you know how many puppeteers it takes to puppeteer something half of his size. So those those guys are they you know just shoved up inside of them, and each of them is working you know half of them in the face or what were you, what were they There's doing? There's two of them inside and somebody outside maneuvering two people probably for the pincer one to hold it in the air and one to to pince it and mm -hmm. and then another person waving the outside the body too waving the tentacle around and uh and somebody else you know doing the the mouth it was it was, and it was hotter than blazes in in italy that summer and so we had to bring in a big air conditioning unit from the airport just to keep them cool inside the creature because it was killing them did uh garrett graham you, know, you talked about all those parties you get any crazy uh garrett graham experiences no garrett had just gone sober uh, like a month or so before coming to Italy. Nice. So he was grumpy. He, yeah. he, he was <laughs> grumpy as shit with all the noise that was going on uh, from the patio because he was trying to be uh, good and his wife was there with him. So uh, he would he was mad about it all. But Mary Warnoff was was there, you know, like, you know, holding court. And uh, Garrett you know, is such a pro though, you know, even as mad as he might get at the noise that was coming out of the patio mm -hmm. uh, on the set, man, he is a monster. He is so funny and so fast and good. Yeah. The, getting into now the not so scary stuff, because when I saw that you directed this documentary, I got so stoked because one of the last things that we studied in film school um, was we had to, you know, we had to feature, touch on it throughout school, but we had to feature one of the artists. And one of the ones that I picked to feature was Dolly and his surrealism look, how he did everything, everything from the melting clocks to the otherworldly. It's almost like a Alice in Underland type style that that guy had to his pieces and everything. I'm curious to hear, what was it that you, that first attracted you to him? Uh, I loved Salvador Dali from the time I was in college. You know, when I discovered him in the school library, uh, his paintings just take you to another world and and are so 
inexplicable and and yet so beautifully rendered and such finely detailed. So I loved, I, I was a big fan of Dolly uh, from when I was 20 years old or so. Uh, later on when I was doing uh, like bonus features for the Disney company, um, they, uh, you know, one of the things little known uh, aspects of Dolly's life is his period in Hollywood uh, he was a big fan of Walt Disney and Disney's artists were big fans of Dali and Disney at one point uh, reached out to Dali and said, you know what, maybe you ought to come here and let's work on something together. And so uh, they did. And uh, Dali came and worked for a number of months at the studio and uh, created story sketches and, and background art for uh, the, what was going to be the very first surrealist uh, animated short. And, uh, but in the end, there's only room for one genius on the Disney lot and that was Walt Disney. And so Disney, right. you know, pulled the plug on the project years and years later, the studio discovered they had this art in the vault and they could not, they didn't own it unless the movie was made. So Roy Disney Jr., who was Walt's uh, nephew, uh, pulled out all the art and uh, made the movie. And hmm. so they wanted to make a documentary about this uh, collaboration between Walt Disney and Salvador Dali. And several producers, you know, shot interviews and tried to put the film together and they never quite satisfied the Disney DVD people. Um, and so they brought it to me and said, you know, here it is. We've got all these interviews. We've got the art and the cooperation of the Dali Foundation. Uh, can you make sense of the story? And so it took months and months of going through the interviews and figuring out and then going and shooting a couple of more interviews and going to Spain. So, uh, and, and shooting at Dali's house and, and, at the at his museum so basically ended up putting that film together and and you know kind of telling the story of this friendship and later on a few years after that uh uh i i uh did the exhibition at the walt disney family museum uh that was disney and dali architects of the imagination because really they're two of the most iconic and influential artists of the 20th century and two guys that were most kind of imbued with the, with the, the sense of technology and the sense of imagination and, and, and uh, psychiatry, you know, uh, of the 20th century. So that, was, I'm sorry to cut no, you off. No, go ahead. That's okay. No, I was just going to say that exhibit, I remember going and being in San Francisco and seeing the, the banners in the Presidio district advertising for it. And I was like, Salvador Dali in Disney. I'm like that, but I, I had no idea up until going to your exhibit that they had, uh -huh. you know, that they, they had worked together. And uh, yeah, that the way that that museum does those special exhibits is really cool too, because it's like its own little mini museum outside of the main Walt Disney uh, museum. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They, it, it, because it was, it was founded by uh, Diane Disney Miller, who was Walt's daughter and um, wants to kind of keep alive the, the artistry of Walt Disney and, and kind of explain to people the life of Walt Disney, the, yeah, their, their special exhibitions are fantastic. You know, I'm hoping, that, I'm hoping how, long, to do another one. how long did that take to, to curate? Cool. That was probably two years, two years from start to finish, because, uh, I mean, museums work a lot slower than movies, you know, so you yeah. just have to, uh, you know, it, it takes a lot of cooperation and a lot of consideration on how to get the art from place to place. And the the Walt Disney Family Museum kind of made a, a, a collaboration with the Dali Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida, who had their own ideas about what they wanted to do. And so it, it took a long time and there was so much art to go through and, and to try to tell the story in a way that I wanted it to be like a movie that you were going to walk through. And, uh, 
and kind of parallel the two artists' lives uh, from their birth until their deaths, you know. And and I think it was, and then we got, uh, we were lucky enough to get um, uh, uh, Sigourney Weaver to do the narration. Right, you know, yeah. Was no, it, was, it was really cool, man. The, oh, cool. the whole Thank experience. You. You, know, you your unique style, whether it be vampires or monsters coming out of the television, or even touching on a iconic franchise, um, you know, being part of the crew of Texas Chainsaw. Is there a monster movie or some kind of a movie that if you you know someone said, you know, Ted, here's a check, make whatever you want to make. What would you want to put a spin on tomorrow? Whew, that's a big question. You know what? I started out doing comedies, which is the, the funniest part of my life. You know, that that in film school, I did kind of fantastical comedies. So, uh, you know, that's a big question because I've got screenplays that I've written that have not gotten made yet. And, and ghost stories. I've got a really good supernatural thriller. Um, if I could do anything, anything. Oh man, that's, I don't know. I really don't know. It sort of depends on the moment, you know, one day I'm into one thing and the next something else. What, uh, what is it that gives you the, the willies, man? What is it that scares you? Uh, what scares me most is people, uh, and what people do to people. And, and in a way I like, monster movies because it takes you one step away from man's cruelty to man, you know, right. and yeah. I, I don't mind monsters cruelty to man one little bit, but I really cringe at torture porn or, you know, movies, even, even slasher films kind of, uh, I, I'm not that interested in, but I, I would love to see a great monster movie or a great uh, science fiction film. Well, I mean, you could always do, uh, you know, somehow, some way, somewhere, television monster comes through a TV on a spaceship. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. I mean, it'd be pretty fun to do, to remake television at this point for a modern world. But, I, but you know what? In a way, I don't like remakes very much because I feel like if a movie kind of hit the mark in the beginning, there's you know, people should go back and watch the classic movies and For educate sure. themselves, you know? Now, television, television stands alone, man. Yeah. Like, like you said, the house, the set design, like everything, like that's kind of like a lightning in the bottle scenario. <laughs> you know what I wanted, uh, you know, uh, my inspiration for, for that film partially was uh, when I was a kid, uh, two movies kind of like haunted me because I, you catch a movie, you don't see the whole thing maybe, you know, uh, but it, but it's images are so arresting. And those two movies for me was, were Invaders from Mars, the original oh, one. Okay. And, uh, and the 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T, which I only saw little bits and pieces of. And they were both expressionistic American productions. Yeah. Uh, and the expressionism, because I was just a kid from Texas, uh, I didn't understand expressionism. I knew from famous monsters of film land, uh, Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, and those images were so uh, attractive to me. So uh, so I, I wanted to do a movie with Terravision that that people might, kids might see on television and and go, what the fuck was that, you know? Yeah. And and kind of haunt them in the same way. I kind of screwed up because if making a movie for kids, you don't put erotic art on the walls, you know. Uh, so so uh, it was a little bit scrambled, but I think it had the same effect. I think it was one of those films that if you didn't see the whole thing, it was something that you remembered and and wanted to figure out what it was, you know. And I think that partially contributed to its longevity you know because when it first came out uh critics hated that film and uh kind of failed it in the theaters and and it was a big big disappointment to me because i was so kind of like thought it was going to be going to make get me somewhere you know and it just got me depressed for a year or two you know uh but 
when I heard from people, you know, years and years later, kids were still turning their friends on to it. And it was, you know, part of one of the rites of passage of seeing horror movies. Uh, and then seeing how it's continued even to now to kind of keep gaining more of an audience, you know, it's like been very happy for me and satisfying. Well, man, I will tell you, I have a lot of cool stuff in my collection over the years of my life. But one thing that I would say I would freak out because of the love of television. If there's ever some kind of a uh, television terror monster, uh, plot, oh, man, go pop or anything. So there you go, man. That, that film has, has stood the test of time. Has, sure. so, oh. has, so has subspecies. I mean, can't go wrong with Salvador Dali and uh, you know that that exhibit and that documentary, and uh, we're the Sacramento Horror Film Festival. But man, if you are a fan of Disney on your soft side, check out Ted's work there. And uh, where can everybody kind of keep keep up with you? You know, reach out if are you on social media or anything? See what yeah, I'm, I'm on Instagram, Ted dot Nicolau or Ted Nicolau and um, on Facebook too. Yeah. You can check me out. Thank you very much, man, for taking the time to uh, do this interview for us. Hey, it was a real pleasure. It was a real pleasure. I hope everybody uh, has a good time at the virtual uh, festival. <laughs>